I'll just uh, start with the topic. As you can see, it's called hypothesis testing. And before we go on, I think uh, we can uh, try to uh, break down this terminology, hypothesis and testing. And since this is an English class, I'm going to presume you know what hypothesis is. Uh, you are basically, you have an assumption. Assumption is, is, is too loose of a term, but like you have, you have a, a predefined uh, notion or a predefined uh, thought, a predefined um, thing you think as true, true, sorry. And you want to test if what you think is correct. And if we recall, in the last two chapters, we were talking about inferential statistics. And in, even in this, this chapter, we're also talking about inferential statistics. If you recall, the point of inferential here is since we cannot actually study every single member of our population, we take a sample. From the sample, we can compute statistics. However, what's really interesting for us is are the parameters of the population itself. So this is what we're trying to do. We are trying to infer things about the population based on our sample. Previously, we did two um, inferential steps, which are, uh, we were studying about how the sampling statistics, such as the mean, were distributed and what we can infer from that, as well as direct parameter estimation. So if my sample mean is 3.1, how much, uh, what's the range of the possible values for my population mean, and so forth. So we have covered that already last week. But arguably, in real life, how often is it that we actually need to know the exact values of parameters? It's often not really the case when you are trying to make a data-driven conclusion uh, or a data-driven uh, decision. Where, like, Say you're in a company and you're trying to decide whether or not to drop a certain feature or a certain um, feature on your website. So it, it may not be the case that you need to actually know the average time, the exact minutes person uses, uh, is on that feature on your website. But perhaps rather than explicitly estimating these parameters, the exact number may not be that interesting for you, but you want to use the sample to test a certain hypothesis or a previous thought concerning those values. So I'm going to give you some samples of hypotheses. So um, it's a conjecture, oh, that's a good word. So a hypothesis is a conjecture, an assumption, actually it's correct, right? It's something that you are, 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 are assuming something that you think is true about a population parameter. So not that the, uh, maybe the mean, is, it, is the mean larger than 30? Is the mean larger than uh, 50? And so forth. And this gives you a good idea. It's, it, it's allowing you to infer things about the nature of the population uh, based on the sample without actually having to put a number on it. You don't really need to know the exact number. So if you already have this uh, conjecture or hypothesis, then you can test it. You, what you're trying to do is um, to, to determine whether or not your hypothesis is probable, or in other words, how can you test the results or the data that you collected and see if your assumption or your results are meaningful. And you're testing, you, what you want to, what, what we're trying to test is if your conclusion, your final conclusion, is it valid? How to do that is that you are trying to figure out if your date, if your conclusion is actually uh, proving your hypothesis, or did it maybe happen by chance? Why is it so important to know if it's by chance or not? Because if it's just chance, a coincidence, then your experiment doesn't really mean anything. You cannot repeat it again. You cannot say with certainty about your conclusion because it just happened by chance. It just so happens that this is the outcome. But you want to see if there's any statistical significance to it. Would If I were to redo my test, would the same output occur? 
Can I reliably reproduce these results again and again? And if so, then it does have some significance and it has some meaning. It brings weight to your conclusion, uh, your data-driven conclusion. So let's uh, go, uh, let's see some examples about uh, hypotheses. So I'm gonna give you some example of some hypotheses. So I want to know, is it correct that the average age of the Indonesian population is 50 years? And is it correct that the mean GPA of UI students is 3.1? Or perhaps if I want to consider multiple groups of people, is it, part, is it true that the mean GPA of FASIKOM UI students is higher than FHA UI students? So note here that I'm making a conjecture about a certain statistic. In this case, I'm talking about means. So average is mean, right? So like here, I'm making a conjecture. I'm assuming something about the mean age of Indonesian population. Uh, I assume it's somewhere around 50. Here, I assume the GPA is somewhere around 3.1, the mean GPA, sorry. And in the last one, I'm comparing two different means. So see here that what we can hypothesize uh, has to do with a certain statistic that you can actually measure from the sample. So you may notice here that I grouped the two first hypotheses together and the bottom one, I separated it. There is one basic difference between these two uh, sets of hypotheses. The first one, note that I'm talking about one group, Indonesians, that's one group. The second one, UI students, that is one group of people, one population. However, in the last one, I'm talking about two groups of uh, two significant groups of people, which are the population of Fasiokom students and the population of FHAUI students. So this brings us to the two types of hypotheses that we are able to test and which we focus on on this particular uh, class of SATPRO. So we have two uh, two cases, which are the one sample case and the two sample case. The one sample case is where, when we're testing within one population, and the two sample case is when we're testing between two populations. Okay, so I now have my hypothesis. I know that it's either concerning one single population or two populations, and now I want to do my hypothesis testing. So as an introduction, we're going to first go over some elements or some things that you need to establish from your data, from your problem, from your task before you can do any testing at all. So these are some important terminologies that uh, you should uh, know by heart by the end of this class. Uh, when I say know by heart, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't mean for you to memorize them word by word, but you should understand what each of them mean. So I'm going to go over them one by one, and then hopefully we can put them together and see how we can solve a hypothesis testing problem. First is the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is written as H O, always H O, I mean H zero, apologies, H null, and it's always written as such. Please do not use any different um, subscripts if you are uh, solving a problem. If you want to de uh, denote the null hypothesis, please always use H null or H zero. And more or less, it is the hypothesis of no relationship or no difference or equals, if you can say uh, no difference. So when I'm trying to hypothesize about uh, the mean, for example, and I say that the mean of I, the, the mean GPA of UI students is 3.1. So this number 3.1, so the mean GPA, I assume this is my null hypothesis that it is equal to 3.1 or no difference. So if I were to, uh, I, or I could also write it as mu minus 3.1 equals zero. Note that I'm using mu here because I am making a hypothesis about the population parameters and not the statistical mean. So 
this is the this is the hypothesis that we usually want to test. I'm going to put a big asterisk on this last point. It is often, but not necessarily, the hypothesis that we wish to disprove. So this is what we are trying to prove wrong. Because um, I'm going to show you a video later on that when we're saying that we reject or we accept the hypothesis, um, we, we can only say for certain about the null hypothesis, but we cannot say for certain anything about the alternate or alternative hypothesis. So basically, the alternative hypothesis is everything else. So if I say here that the null hypothesis is the mean GPA is 3.1, then any other value of GPA would fall under the alternate hypothesis. Mu equals 3.0, mu equals 2.9, and so forth. Every single other outcome would fall under the alternate hypothesis. Now here, when you're denoting the alternative uh, hypothesis, here you have some leeway. You can use H A, H A, a small A or large A, H one, etc. It's uh, you kind of have leeway here as long as you do not denote it as H zero or H null because that is reserved for the null hypothesis. And uh, this is often considered the research hypothesis. And um, when we say we reject the null one, we say that the alternate hypothesis is then feasible. Not necessarily true, but feasible. And this is basically uh, similar to the method of indirect proof that you have probably already covered in your discrete mathematics course. So if I had a non-directional hypothesis, so previously, if I said that, oh, mu is equal to 3.1, then the alternate one, if it was non-directional, then anything else other than 3.1, that is my A. HA or my alternate hypothesis. However, I could also define a one-tailed test in which I actually care in which direction the value goes. So it could be either the mu is larger than 3.1 or the mu is smaller than 3.1. And in this case, we need to consider uh, to the, the, the direction in which it falls. We're gonna cover that in more detail later on. So what do we need to do then? in order for us to make a conclusion about the parameter of the population parameters. Well, obviously we need to test something. What is it that we are, we are able to compute? We can compute the test statistics, remember? From our population, it's not really possible for us to actually compute anything because there's no way we could actually get data from every single member of our population. But we could take some statistics. So these sample statistics, whatever it is that we compute from our um, uh, sample is what we're going to use uh, to determine or make a conclusion against the hypothesis. And this statistic can be any statistic or any combination of statistics measured from the sample. We could use the mean, variance, standard deviation of the sample, and so forth. And then since we have the test statistic, we can then uh, make some sort of uh, conclusion about uh, the hypothesis that we determined in the beginning. So from the results of hypothesis testing, this is a statistical test, which means there is always a level of error that you can expect. And when we decide to reject or not reject the null hypothesis, there are four possible situations. So it could be that your null hypothesis is true, but you instead reject it and so forth. So let's see what happens here. When my null hypothesis is false and I reject it, then I'm right. Uh, furthermore, if the null hypothesis is true and I do not reject it, then I'm also right. But in the other cases, when the null hypothesis is actually true, but I accidentally reject it, or when it's false and I accidentally not rejected, then I have an error. And if you can see here, we have a type one error and a type two error. Sometimes we also, um, you may also find literature that refer to these errors as um, false negatives or false positives. Um, so the first one is false negative, and this is a false positive. And does it matter? In some cases, it does. 
the specific conditions of your research or what you're particularly considering, it might make a lot of difference. Like, is it more dangerous to reject your H null or is it more dangerous not to reject it if it's false? Depends on what you're doing. Like, imagine if you're if you're trying to hypothesize the level of um, uh, contaminants in a certain product, obviously then it probably it's safe it's safer to say that um, like if I say like the level of contaminants must uh, must be less than three, for example, maybe it's safer for me to assume that it is lethal instead when it's not. Uh, other than saying that it's safe when it's actually lethal. So depending on what, what problem that you're currently modeling, it does matter in some cases what type of error you obtain. So in ge the general approach is though that these, this is a, a trade-off. So if you try to minimize the type one error, then pr probably your type two error will be, will be more likely to occur. And vice versa. So when we're talking about errors in your testing, as I mentioned, you have a reservation. You know that there is some level of error that you can expect because it's statistical testing. It's not something that is definite. It's not an exact yes or no for anything that you are, to, that you are testing. So you have to give yourself some buffer and some room for error which we consider in our level of the significance or alpha. Just like when we were talking about the, when we were estimating the parameters in the last chapter, we allow ourselves some level of error. So in this case, when I say uh, the level of significance is 5% or our, my alpha is 0 0.05, then it shows the probability of getting a type one error. What's the probability that I reject my null hypothesis when I shouldn't reject it? And this is established at the beginning. From the beginning, we establish the alpha. And uh, sometimes if you find a problem, it will not give you your uh, alpha. And in that case, you can determine it on, on your own. You can say that, oh, I can say this with a level of significance of alpha 0.05. 0.01. Once again, if you are doing a, an exam in this class, if it's not given to you, you are free to put your assumption at the very top. Before you do anything, write your assumption. I'm assuming an alpha of 0.05. And the, in my opinion, between 0.05 and 0.01, I would err to 0.05 just because that's a little bit more tolerance for error. And uh, it's a safe bet to use at that level of significance. So what it means when you say that, oh, I reject my null hypothesis at a 0.05 level of significance, that means that the difference between whatever you observe, the statistic, the mean, the whatever that you observe from your sample and the hypothesis value of your parameter of the population is statistically significant at that level. That means that, uh, it is statistically significant, but I have a 0.05 chance of being wrong. So what is it that we do when we are trying to test our hypothesis? We have an assumption, we have those H0, we have our H0 and HA, we have our hypothesis and our alternate hypothesis. We use our test statistics to measure the statistics in the sample. And now I need to know where does this test statistic fall in regards to a normal distribution? So we also have something called the region of rejection. When we use a level of significance, if you recall the, the symbol of, um, when you recall when we were talking about the normal distribution, we had the Z alpha here. And if you're not talking about the normal one, you have, T alpha N, when you have talking about the T distribution, that alpha, if you remember correctly, is when I have a normal distribution, in this case, the Z case, and I say that my alpha is 0.05, this value is where I draw the line 
so that I know that 0 0.05 parts of my population falls on the right hand side. So following that logic, based on the alpha that we determined from the beginning, this is where we draw those lines. This is the line in which we say, oh, if my test statistic falls here, then I do not reject my hypothesis. However, if my test statistic falls here, then I have to reject my hypothesis. This is why we call it a region of rejection or rejection region. It's basically telling you which part of the bell curve that in which uh, that you that, that sorry guys, which area of the bell curve will you say that your hypothesis is rejected if the test statistic falls into that area? And it is very correlated with the concept of critical values that we covered in the normal distribution chapter as well. So it shows this proportion of the area that is equal to the probability of type one error, which is uh, type one error is when you reject your H0, no, which you accept, when you reject your H0, when your H0 is true. So what we want to do is for every single hypothesis that we have, we need to determine where is our rejection region. So this one is an illustration, okay? The, 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 the picture that I'm showing right now is obviously an illustration. So what we can do is we can do a one-tail test as well as a two-tailed test. I think this look, sounds familiar. Remember when we had the uh, directional and non-directional uh, hy alternate hypothesis? So the first one is the one-tailed test. This happens when our alternate hypothesis is directional. The region of, the reg region of rejection is either in the left or the right tail. In this illustration, I put it on the right-hand side. Then the test of the null hypothesis against this directional alternative is a one-tailed test. So this will be the area in which our test, if our test statistic falls here, then I do not reject, but in here, I will reject. Note that in this case, I only have one area here on the right hand or on the left hand. So I would use this critical value would be Z alpha. Like alpha, if I use 0 0.05, this would be zero, Z 0 0.05. Next, we also have the two-tailed test. So the two-tailed test occurs when we have the region of the region of rejection is on either on both sides, sorry, not either, both sides, both on the left and on the right, not only one. And this uh, is used when our alternative hypothesis is non-directional, or in other words, uh, I don't care if it's larger than or less than. I just know that I just need to know that it's not that value. And this is called a two-tailed test. Note here that since we have two regions, this critical value would be Z alpha divided by two. And this critical value would be minus Z alpha divided by two because we're separating these areas into these proportions into two sides. Okay, so that brings us to the end of all of the theories, all of the, uh, what's it called? All of the terminology. So I'm going to use these terms interchangeably in the next uh, section of the, of the presentation. And we're going to actually do the hypothesis testing. So basically there are four main steps that you need to do when you are completing a hypothesis testing problem. This is valid in real hypothesis testing as well as when you're doing your assignment or if you're doing your exam. You must explicitly indicate what step you are completing. So please do not skip over them and please do not um, just write them down in, 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 in not in order. Uh, when you're answering a question, please clearly state your hypothesis, set the rejection region, compute the test statistic, and interpret the results in that order. So first, you need to determine your, your hypothesis, your null hypothesis, and your alternate 
hypothesis. So as an example, when you have a non-directional uh, test, so then, oh, sorry, this should not be HA, apologies. So this should not be HA. So if it's non-directional, when your null hypothesis is equal, uh, mean equal 65, let me correct that real quick. I'm going to continue. So first, what we need to do is we need to state our hypothesis, and that is the most difficult part in my personal opinion. If we have a non-directional test, then I can assume that what that means is that if my mu is equal to 65, that is my null hypothesis, that's my uh, hypothesis of zero difference, and the alternate hypothesis is everything else. I don't care if it's less or uh, less or more than, um, than 65. When I have a directional hypothesis, so if I were to determine my null hypothesis that the mean is 65, then my alternate hypothesis would show that it's uh, actually less than 65 or more than 65. In order for us not to confuse the equals here, oftentimes this is rewritten. So H, if the H null is uh, larger and equal than 65, then my alternate hypothesis is that the mu is less than 65, or if the H null is smaller or equal to 65, my H alpha is mu larger than 65. This is just to not confuse it with the non-directional hypothesis. And note that the equals always is included with the null hypothesis because as we remember the hypothesis, uh, the, sorry, the null hypothesis is the hypothesis with zero difference. So the most, the, 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 the more difficult thing in my personal opinion about the hypothesis testing the hypothesis determination when you're stating the hypothesis is to translate the, 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 the problem into the correct hypothesis. Here I'm showing you a, a cheat sheet, if you will, uh, on the common phrases that are often used in hypothesis testing problems. So if it says like, oh, then we hypothesize that the mean is greater than, is above, is bigger than, that means that we are trying to test larger than and so forth. So this is just a hypothesis testing common phrases because in my opinion, this is the most difficult part. So you guys are a little bit um, uh, lucky in the sense that you're having your class in English and this common phrases uh, cheat sheet is also in English. Hopefully uh, it'll help you when you're trying to translate the problems into the hypothesis. So after we determine our hypotheses, now we need to know how can I reject the H null if need be. So next we need to determine in uh, uh, our, our bell curve in the sense like where is the rejection region and where is the non-rejection region? Where is the critical value at which I draw my line that if it falls less uh, on this side, then I will reject H null. And if it falls on that side, I will not reject H null. So in order to do that, you need to set the level of significance. If it's given to you in the problem, you use that. If it's not given to you, then you make an assumption, your level of significance, alpha equals 0 0.05, for example. Then you need to determine if you need to use the Z distribution or the T distribution. If you recall, when we were talking about uh, these distributions, I mentioned that the T distribution is the most extensively used. Here you go. And you need to determine your critical values. Remember that it will be two-tailed if you are having a non-directional uh, alternative uh, hypothesis, and it would be one-tailed if it's directional. And what, distrib what distribution to use? When sigma is known, z-score, you use your z-table. When sigma is not known, you use your t-table. And I'm going to put an asterisk on that last one. In practice, in real statistical um, testing, usually you have a lot of data. So if you remember your T distribution, basically the more data you have, your T bell shape will look something like a normal distribution. So you could assume that your distribution is normal and then use a Z score if you have uh, enough data points. 
But when I say enough, usually I mean like thousands and thousands. So in the context of this course, we are going to focus on the first two only. If you know your sigma, use your Z table or your Z scores. If you do not know your sigma, then you use your T table. So after we determine, okay, now I have my hypothesis, I have my areas of rejection. Now I need to compute my test statistic because I need to know that this statistic, where does it fall? Does it fall in the rejection region or not? So in order to do that, I need to compute the statistics from our sample. I need to compute the mean perhaps, I need to compute the, the variance perhaps, and it differs what statistic that I need to use depending on the type of data that I am handling. I will go back more on this. So we're going to go into the technical, the technical things like which formula to use for which case later on uh, in this presentation. Right now, it's suffice to know that you compute some sort of statistic using your sample, and then you figure out where it falls. Does it fall here or does it fall there? And lastly, you need to interpret the results. So I would like to show you a video after this. So when you say interpret the results, there are two things that you could conclude after hypothesis testing. So your, your test statistic that you computed could have fallen here, and it could have fallen somewhere there, right? If it falls here, then you can say you reject your null hypothesis. If it falls here, then you say, I do not reject my null hypothesis. So please note that this one here, I do not reject my H null, does not automatically mean that your H alternate is correct. It only proves that we have insufficient evidence to reject your H null. And on that note, I would like to show some context. Um, we have some steps when we are trying to complete or, or, or conduct hypothesis testing. We have to determine the hypothesis. We need to determine the rejection region. We need to determine or compute the test statistic and we need to make a conclusion. So when I say the rejection region where you need to draw your critical values, that depends on the level of significance that you use. But when I say, um, we need to compute the test statistic. Well, that depends on what population, what type of, what the type of population that you're currently considering. So these are the cases right now that I'm showing on the screen. These are the cases or the more common cases that um, we can try to handle. So in, so um, I hope that uh, you guys have probably at one point looked at the textbook. We are going to focus on the case where we have one normal population. So the example that I showed in the front, like when the mean of the GPA of UI students is 3.1, we're only talking about one population, one population of UI students. Or when you have two normal populations, when we were comparing the UI students in FASIOCOM and at FHUI. And once again, if we know about the variance, just like when we were computing the parameter estimation, when we were computing the confidence intervals, it differs if you know the variance or not, because if you know the variance of the population, you can assume the Z table, you can use the Z table, you can use the standard normal table, because with this variance, you can convert your data into a Z score. However, if your variance is not known, then uh, it would be too bold of us to assume that it, you can use the Z table, so we will use the T table instead. So we're going to look at these cases. Oops, okay, these cases. First up is when we are doing some hypothesis testing of only one normal population. I'm only having one population in consideration and I have either two, I have two possibilities. Either I know the variance or I do not know the variance. So the first case is when the one normal population, when I have one normal population and I know the standard deviation. In this case, then you can see that based on our interpretations, there are three ways that we could define the H0 and H1 or HA. 
Here we could either have a non-directional hypothesis, this one. This is two-tailed or, or non-directional when the mu is equal to some sort of value and the alternate is that the mu is not equal to that certain value. Or we could have a directional one in both ways. So it can either be uh, the null hypothesis is less than equal than or the, and the alternate is larger and the other way around. So these are the three cases. So based on that, we need to compute the test statistic. This is my test statistic. It's the same for all three cases, this one here. And we need to determine where is our rejection region. So in this, in the first case is, uh, so basically what we have is this is our Z table, our Z score uh, graph, because we use the Z score here. And if my TS, uh, my absolute value of TS falls either there, this is Z alpha divided by two, this is Z alpha divided by two, this is minus, right? So uh, this is the, the absolute, so that means it's either less than the minus or, or more than the positive. This is my rejected region, or the other cases is if my uh, TS is larger than ZA, or if it is, less than ZA. So it depends on which one you are currently considering. You can ignore the rightmost uh, column. You don't really need to know that right now. So we're going to look at an example. So as I mentioned, the first step is probably the most difficult. So let's look at this example. A research psychologist plans to administer a test designed to measure self-confidence to a sample of 50, 50 professional athletes. The psychologist theorizes that the professional athletes tend to be more confident, self-confident than others. The national norm of the test, blah, 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 blah. So the sample mean of the athletes and the test whether that is really true. Okay, so let's read this. We're talking about professional athletes here. So we know that there is one population, which is the professional athletes. This is the number of athletes that I take in my sample. That's my N. So the psychologist theorizes that the professional athletes is more self-confidence than other people. So the national norm of the test is 72. So the national norm is 72. And the, the psychologist assumes that the professional athletes should have a score larger than 72 because they are theorized to be more self-confident than others. So here we have our uh, first, our null hypothesis that the mu, in this case, my population is athletes, should be, uh, uh, sorry, it should be larger than 72. So my, um, my uh, null hypothesis should be the one with no difference. So less and equal than 72. That's what I'm trying to disprove. And my research hypothesis, H1, is what happens when the mu is then larger than 72. So this is what is theorized by the psychologist. And let's look, this is the national norm, 72. That's what we're trying to assume. And the standard deviation is 13.3. We know the standard deviation. And since the sample mean of athletes, this is the sample mean of athletes, that's X. Uh, we want to test if this is true, we use an alpha of 0 0.05. So here we need to determine our steps. This is my first step. This is my hypothesis. The second step is rejection region. So my rejection region depends on my alpha here. And as you notice here that what I'm trying to do is, oh, I want to uh, do a directional hypothesis. That means I need to use um, my uh, alpha in its entirety. And let's look at the possible cases. Since I need to compute the H null is less than less and equal to something and the H1 is more than, that means I'm trying to use that one there. 
So I need to, my, my rejection region is reject if TS is larger than Z alpha. So rejection region or reject if uh, my test statistic is larger than Z 0 0.05. So if you recall, uh, I'm going to bring up my uh, table. Find it. Where is my Z table? Here we go. This is my Z table. Oops, oops, oops. Z table here. So note, I'm not looking up the table. I'm doing the opposite. Uh, that that I want to know where is my critical value. But don't worry. In this one that I provided provided on Scale, you're actually already given the ZAs for every alpha. So these are the alphas that are usually used. And in our case, we're using 0 0.05. So I know that my Z alpha is 1.645. I know that I need to reject it if the test statistic is larger than 1.645. So assume I computed this test statistic, test statistic, test statistic sorry. I computed the test statistic equal to something uh, based on that equation. And then I need to take a conclusion. I believe I've already computed it. So let me go to the next slide. Yes, I have. And here is the conclusions that I took out from our definition. And uh, the hypothesis is that the H null is equal. Don't forget that it's often uh, ambiguous. So I personally prefer to denote it as such. And then this is my rejection region. One uh, is larger than, uh, when it's larger than 1.645. This is my test statistic. And let's see, we're comparing our test statistic. I said that we need to reject my null hypothesis. If reject, if my test statistic is larger than 1.645, let's see our result, 1.12, ooh. So this is not true. Since it does not fall in the rejection region, we conclude that we cannot reject H null. What does that mean? I cannot reject this. So I can accept H null. That means that the norm, if you put it back to the, the, the narration here, the, the average of self-confidence of the professional athletes is not proven false. So I have not proven that it is less than equal to 72. And thus the psychologist's um, assumption, the theory is not proven true because here I cannot reject this with absolute certainty. Recall in the video, be careful when you're saying I do not reject. It does not immediately mean um, I does not, uh, when I do not reject it, I accept it. That means that this is not proven enough. I do not have enough uh, evidence to prove it untrue. So be careful. This is not something definite, yes, no, but you can have some um, ideas or some indications from the hypothesis. testing. So this is the example when I know the uh, sigma when I know the standard deviation of the population. But in reality, you may, assume, you, you may have already guessed, usually we do not know the sigma. It's, it's not known to us because it's the parameters of the population. It's, it's very rare that we already know some parameters of the population. Thus, when it is unknown, we then use the standard and we assume a T distribution instead of a Z distribution. So you may notice that the test statistic here is identical. So we still use the same test statistic, the same test statistic. And here are the same cases. This is non-directional, this is directional. But what we use for our um, rejection region, instead of the Z-score, we use the T-score. And then you follow it the exact same way. So for an example here, you can see that the nutritionist believes that, let's try to uh, read this together. A nutritionist believes that a 12 ounce box of breakfast cereal should contain an average of 1.2 ounces of corn. So this is 
the average that is assumed. And then the nutritionist measures a random 30 boxes. This is our M of a popular cereal for corn content. And we obtain a mean of 1.17 ounces of corn. This is our sample mean. And this is our sample standard deviation. Does the, in, does the data indicate that the mean corn content of all boxes in the cereals differs from 1.2 ounces? Does this mean that it is different from 1.2 ounces? Use an alpha of 0 0.05. So here in my first step, I need to define my hypothesis. And here I want to know if it is equal or not from 1.2 ounces. So my no hypothesis is the hypothesis of no difference. The mean is 1.2. But I want to know, this is my uh, research what I want to what I want to know is that the what I'm trying to prove or my research is that the alternate hypothesis is that the mean is actually not 1.2. So here is it did they indicate that the mean corn content of all boxes differs from 1.2 ounces? Is it different or is it not different? So following the same uh, here this this table that means we are considering this first category here, and I can then determine the rejection region. That's the rejection region is, I need to reject if TS is, TS, sorry, is larger than T alpha divided by two, alpha divided by two is 0 0.025, comma, the degrees of freedom is N minus one, so 29. As you remember, we can use the T, table to do that. And so when we are computing T 0 0.025, 20, 29, T 0 0.025, 29, give me a sec. 29 degrees of freedom, here we go, 29 degrees of freedom. And uh, I want to use, uh, what was it, 0 0.025? 0 0.025, so it's here. Somewhere here, 29, 2.045. So that is our um, uh, rejection region. Or if my TS is larger than 2.045. And then I compute my test statistic using that equation here, this one. And then I want to see if it is larger or not from 2.045. So as you see here, I've already computed it once again. Uh, we thought we found that is it larger? Is it larger than? We need to see if the absolute value is larger. So is 1.4803 larger than uh, 2.0.05? It is not. And once again, we cannot reject H norm. So what we're trying to do is we want to prove it wrong, and I can. Okay, so up until now, we considered only one population. As mentioned, we can also consider the case in which we have two normal populations. Once again, we have two cases when the variances are known or with the, the standard deviations are known or when they are unknown but assumed to be equal. This is the first case, two normal populations, and we assume that the, va the variances are known. I've tried to, to put together a slide that is a little bit easier to read. So in the case of two normal populations, when the variances are known, you can use this test statistic, and you can also see all of the, the possible um, H nulls and alternate uh, hypotheses, and these are the rejection regions. So we're going to try some. We're going to read this example together. So first, two new methods for producing a tire have been proposed. To ascertain which method is superior, a tire manufactures a sample of 10 tires using the first method, this is N, and a second sample of eight using the second one. N and M because we have two populations. The first set is road tested at location A and the second at location B. 
It is known that from past experience that the lifetime of a tire in the road is tested in one of these locations as normally distribution with the mean life due to tire. So we're already assuming that it's normally distributed and a variance to the, due to the location. And it is known that the variance is actually known. So for the tires tested at location A, the standard deviation is 4,000 kilometers. This is the standard deviation of A. And this is the standard deviation of uh, B. So when the manufacturer is interested in testing the hypothesis that there is no appreciable difference in the mean, oh, let's see, what's my hypothesis? There is no appreciable difference or the hypothesis of no difference. And I need to calculate a 5% level of significance, so my alpha. 0 0.045, and this is my data. So what you need to do is when you need when you need to compute this test, this test statistic, obviously you need to be compute the mean of the sample of X and the mean of the second sample. So the first uh, the first uh, thing you need to compute is oh sorry not mu apologies, but you need to compute the average, oops, the average values here, and then the, let's not use that symbol, A and the average at B. Then you will need to follow the steps that we have uh, determined. First, what's our hypothesis and what's your rejection region and so on and so forth. So for this case, we have already, you, you should have already computed your average in the first population. Oops. We used A and B, right? So apologies. So uh, we have the average in the first one. We have the uh, average in the first, um, in the first population, the average in the second population. You already have your alpha. What else do we know? We have our alpha, we have our, N is 10, M is eight. Um, and what else do we know? We know the, oh, we know the sigmas. So we know sigma alpha is 4,000. And we know that sigma beta is 6,000. So after we compute this, you need to compute this on your own. What do we need to hypothesize? If the manufacturer is interested in testing the hypothesis that there is no appreciable differences, no appreciable, dif appreciable differences or the hypothesis of no difference, I can say that here, my H null is that there is no appreciable differences between the two, while my alternate hypothesis is that it's not equal between A and B. So if you can see here, we have this, is our case that we need to compute. Based on that information, I know that I need to uh, reject anything that falls between uh, this area here. In other words, reject H null if the test statistic is larger than Z 0 0.025. Once again, you can use the table to check Z 0.0.025. Z, Z, sorry, Z 0 0.025, where's our table? Z 0 0.025, it's 1.960. And then we can continue with the rest. So I have already pre-computed everything for you. So you can see here that uh, I have computed my Z score. This is my uh, test statistic, oh, sorry, my rejection region. And this is the test statistic, and you obtain 0 0.066. And since uh, it actually, uh, sorry, it, it does not, sorry, it does not fall into this category, then the null hypothesis cannot be rejected. I have, I don't have enough evidence to say that there is no difference between the tires tested at A and so note here that in this context, so what was being tested? So the manufacturer wanted to test if there is no difference of the tires produced at 
uh, A and at B and road tested at A and B. But actually from our hypothesis testing, we cannot reject null. So I cannot reject, I cannot reject that they are equal. So I can only say that I do not have enough uh, evidence to uh, say that this is untrue. However, it does not automatically mean that this is true. This one, the, the alternate is true. I only know that this is not, not, sorry, this is not untrue. There you go. So a double negation there. And finally, obviously, we have the last case of unknown variances, which I have tried to uh, compile here on this slide. This is your test statistic that you need to use. It is quite complicated in the sense that you need to compute something separately here. This is the pooled estimator of, uh, of the uh, sigma. So basically, this is just an estimation of the variances, because here we assume that they are uh, are, are equal. Ooh, I just realized a typo on the title here. Let's correct that real quick. Are unknown, but equal. There you go. So um, we assume that they are unknown, but equal. And that, that way we can assume that we can, uh, sorry, we can estimate it using this pooled estimator. And then you can use the correct correlation or the correct um, relation that you want to test for every single one. For example, here, 22 volunteers at this cold research institute caught a cold after being exposed to cold viruses. So I have this population, which is treated with vitamin C. So I have uh, 10 people in this group. The second group has 12 volunteers. So I have another group here. So the control group is, a, is given placebo. So they're not given the vitamin C and this one is given with the vitamin C. So what we are trying to conclude is that uh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, the length of the time of recovery. So this is the resulting data, the, the, the data of the time of recovery. So does this data, prove that taking four grams daily, so this one here, reduces the mean length of the time of a cold, of the cold. So in other words, I want to know if this mean is reduced less than this mean. That's what I'm trying to do. So let's see what we are, what we know and what we don't know. Note that in this case, we are not given the variances, so we know that they are unknown. That's obvious. However, we're also not being, we're not explicitly given the information that they are equal. We make that assumption. We, in this particular problem, it's quite safe to assume that the variance is equal because these 22 volunteers, the 10 in the first group and the 12 in the second group, both come from the same population. They are all people working at that same cold research institute. However, to make it uh, clear, we can ass assume it from the beginning. And lastly, we are also not given a level of significance. We're not given an alpha. So first order of business is to put down the assumptions that we use. We assume that the alpha is 0 0.05 and that two populations are normal with equal variances. That way we can use these solutions to complete the hypothesis testing. When in doubt, please write down whatever assumptions you use in your solution. So the hypothesis is that we wanted to know, does this data prove that the people who take vitamin C, so these people, uh, have a less amount of be time of being sick compared to those with a placebo. In other words, my H null, the hypothesis of no difference. I want to know if the people that are given uh, the vitamin C have less time to recover compared to those with a placebo. And if not, the alternate hypothesis is that do the people being treated are the people being treated with um, 
the vitamin C uh, uh, take longer than those that are not treated with vitamin C. And based on this, as we did before, we can determine the region of rejection. We can then determine also the test statistic and we can see if it follows in the same place or not. I don't believe I've completed this uh, example yet. So uh, feel free to continue this on your own. Okay, so as a T uh, T uh, sorry, as a TLDR, we now can do some testing given that we have uh, specific information known to us. Uh, and we, I am limiting it for the purposes of this class to these four cases only. So we can uh, do hypothesis testing from one normal population if the variance is known and unknown, two normal populations if the variances are known but and unknown but equal. Once again, this is not the only scenarios that we can compute. If you go at your uh, look at your textbook, you can also do hypothesis testing of variance hypothesis testing of Bernoulli populations. Just know that we are not limited to these four only. I'm limiting it for the purposes of this class.